are still to arrive, so perhaps I will start a little bit slowly. So if you remember, yesterday we had a description. Uh, we, we had a discussion about how the tautological ring of Mg looks like, and actually the description applies both to the tau one and to the one in cohomology, as actually there is not a, a single case, uh, I mean we don't have a single proof that these two things are actually uh, going to be different. So uh, we recall the fact that uh, these rings have a nice structure and that up to some extent, they, up to a certain g, so for g at most 23, there is this nice symmetry coming from the fact that, it, that there is a perfect pairing. Let me write it for Rh, but I see it actually works in, in both cases. Now we have some kind of a fake uh, top degree, the one g minus 2, which is the, li the last one for which the tautological group is different from 0. And this should actually go in Rh g minus 2, but this is isomorphic to Q uh, generated by the K, uh, kappa g minus 2 class. And this is is a perfect pairing. But as we discussed, there is an expectation that if we take the genus equal to 24, maybe a counter example. So it looks like there is some, some, something special that stops to happen at this point. So at around the time when I got my PhD, this kind of, uh, the, the existence of such a, the fact that such a pairing would be perfect was, some, uh, w was widely expected. By now people have become much, uh, very skeptical about this. We will discuss more about this later. But the point is that the new expectation is that perhaps it is just a unifying construction that generates all possible relations in this ring. So what would the relation be? If you remember, we, we have a set of generators. The kappa classes of the relation would simply be a polynomial in the kappa classes that vanishes. This unified construction arises from something that uh, Faber and Zahir uh, observed at around the 2000. So the, this unified formula is due as a formula to Faber and Zahir, who started to work with all known relations over time to find out which kind of a general pattern they were satisfied. So here there is no geometry, it's just numerology. If you have a sufficiently high number of relations, you can try to put them in order and say, well, is there a way to obtain them? It's a systematical way in the, from the same kind of formula. But now, so. This is just for Mg, but now 
it's known how to generalize this kind of relation actually to the tautological ring of n, g, n, bar even. I reverse the whole task. Well, and then proved I fixed on the Padari Pande, I think, at about 2010. And again, I mean, if you wish, I can write this family of relations for you, but there is nothing geometrical about this. It. It's just a way to write some, uh, um, some formal power series and then uh, taking the coefficients of it give the give the relations uh, which we which we want to be uh, satisfied so uh, what do you prefer would you like me to write the relations for you or shall i simply state what the properties are so anybody what wants no, no, because no. the single <laughs> relation doesn't say anything. It's the formal power series that encodes the information. So either you get all relations or you get none. The Sorry? The property. The property. <laughs> well, there is nothing. So the idea is that they are expressed as coefficients in a formal power series. in some dummy variables. Well, first there is some kind of variable t which keeps track of the degree, and then one has a strange bunch of variables, p1, p3, p4, p6, p7, you know, they are labeled by natural numbers, so by positive integers, which are not um, congruent to 2 modulo 3. And then, so this is a set of variables, then the coefficients have to live in the cohomology ring, and in a certain range, one has that all coefficients of power series vanish. In particular, they give, if we fix a fixed uh, genus G and a fixed co-dimension, we get finitely many relations. Let me just give two remarks. So if these are all the relations that exist, so the relations we can describe in this way and then all multiples of them, this would imply that certainly this pairing is not perfect uh, uh, starting for 24. So somehow this expectation substitutes the previous one. And I don't know whether it's nicer or less nice because uh, yeah, depending on the properties you're interested in. And secondly, uh, since this expectation holds for both for Chow and for cohomology, of course, if this is true, uh, we, we get, of course, that, uh, that uh, so if the same conjectural description applies uh, to the relations in both rings, of course, <laughs> given they have the same generators, they are isomorphic. Uh, is a, it may be, well, as we discussed yesterday, we have not proved that it is a counterexample. So people have constructed tons and tons of relations, but if you remember, there were two degrees, if I remember correctly, 10 and 12, and in, the, in one degree, the dimension was known, in the other degree, we couldn't, people can choose, perhaps it's the same, but as far as we know, it may be one more. 
So one would need some additional relation that nobody knows and nobody has seen in practice. And considering uh, there are so many independent uh, ways of constructing relations, uh, that's why people expect actually this to be a counterexample. If you wish to prove that this is a counterexample, you simply need to uh, study better the um, the classes which are non-tautological, because perhaps you can prove the independence of the 37 generators by intersecting all of them with sufficiently many classes which are not in the tautological subring, because it's a subring, so somehow if the intersection numbers with other classes in the subring are equal, the classes may be equal. But if you want to know whether they are numerically equivalent, you need to know whether they intersect in the same way also with all other classes which are non-tautological. So perhaps there is some nice, some, uh, nice geometric uh, class that has this property, but you know. Yeah. But so far, nobody has, a sh <laughs> has appeared uh, with a... No, the, um, the relation with the genus and the degree is that uh, if you take the pow formal power series, uh, there is a range starting from which uh, the coefficients have to be zero. And that range depends on G. And then I need to look, uh, and then there is some kind of um, divisibility conditions for the things you need to, to take, and that also depends on the genus. So yes, there is a dependency on the genus. If you look at the formulas, it's a little bit hidden, but it's there. So somehow the case of genus G without mark points is the most uh, exciting one because it's the most intuitive one. I mean, we know many things about the geometry of smooth curves. So theoretically, we, could, uh, we can exploit any kind of a geometrical construction to explore the tautological thing, because in general, geometric constructions have some kind of interpretation and they depend on the curve and some kind of a choice of data over it, some additional structure, I don't know, a divisor, mark points, whatever. So you can interpret them as something that depends on some uh, uh, modular space which has a natural vibration over MG, and then we can do things there using the geometry and then push everything forward to the tautological ring, oh, uh, sorry, to MG, hoping that everything ends up in the tautological ring, it needs to be proved, and then using this to discover relations. But anyway, these uh, uh, kind of problems we discussed, they generalize to um, mark points and to the compactification, giving something which I will call for you Faber type conjectures. This is just uh, the way in which the properties we have seen or we have discussed as conjectural for MG generalized to the partial compactifications. If you remember, we have three of them. We had curves with rational tails. In this case, we have a component of genus G, and all other components need to have genus zero. Sorry that I didn't draw the mark points for you, but of course, we need them to stabilize it. This lies inside curves of compact type. I mean, this guy here is interested it's, interest, uh, in, it's interesting to study it uh, separately only if G is at least two, because otherwise it would, be, it would coincide with the next one. And then this is the full compactification. Somehow MG and rational tails is the natural generalization of MG in this kind of situation, because if we want to have rational tails, well, we can add a rational tail. To add a rational tail, we need to have at least two mark points. So MGN, so MGNRT is the same thing as MGN if N is zero or one. So somehow we should obtain again what we obtained before by taking rational tails and N equal to zero. So if you remember um, the first uh, 
the first season where we were expecting there to be some kind of perfect pairing, which we should, well, even if it's not perfect, some kind of pairing between tautological classes that should encode at least most information, at least the information that's coming from tautological classes themselves, is that there was this uh, uh, vanishing phenomenon. The, the tautological link vanishes starting from a certain degree, and in the last degree, which is non-trivial, it's one-dimensional. Uh, here, actually, um, constructing a pairing may be easier because if you look at M bar GN, well, here certainly we have a pairing because we can take uh, two classes and just take their, uh, their cap product, for instance, in homology or their product in the, in the Chow ring. So we would like to be able to simply restrict this pairing to these two spaces. And the idea is that we take the pairing of the lift of two classes and we multiply them by a class that vanishes on the boundary. So what are the classes vanishing on the boundary, for instance, on the complement of the locus with rational tails? So if you remember, the, well, let's start here. Curves of compact types were just the complement of a divisor because we wanted to remove our curves with non-separating nodes. So we are taking away the divisor parametrizing irreducible nodal curves and all the degenerations. So what is vanishing there? Well, the idea is that we have our Hodge bundle that depends on how many independent differentials there are on the curve. And if you take a curve which is reducible with a node, then its normalization has genus G minus 1, at least if we have just that single node. And this implies that a Hodge bundle degenerates. It does not have full rank. And so if we take its top term class, which is lambda G, it has to vanish on the locus. Uh, on the device of delta zero. So this is just the locus of all irreducible curves with at least one node, and then we take its closure. And as I recalled, This is exactly what we have to remove if we want to obtain the open subset of curves of compact type. So the idea is that if we take two classes here, we can lift them there, and if we multiply them by lambda g, the, in the, the degree of the intersection does not depend on the choice uh, uh, of lifting we, we took. Then we s on the same principle, we, one can prove that the product of lambda g and lambda g minus 1 vanishes on the complement of the space of curves with rational tails. So why is that? Let me assume, as I said, G is least true, otherwise it's a subcase of what we had previously. The idea is that we have something which is not of this form. It will lie, it will be contained in one of the boundary divisors in which one component, in which both components have degrees smaller than G because this is always such kind of curve is always contained only in the divisor that has a component of genus G and one of genus zero. And then we add the mark points to stabilize the thing. So let us assume we take any of the divisor, so we just take two genera that add up to G, and then we want them both to be positive. So this is, will imply that, we are, that both are smaller than G. So 
if we take the Hodge band and we restrict to the stratum, how does it behave? Well, I mean, here we are just taking the product of two curves, so if we want to take a, differen a differential form, uh, well, we can, it will be a product of differential forms on the two, uh, on the two components of the curve. So this is actually the direct sum of HG1 and HG2. I will put a prime here to say, well, they live, of course, on different spaces. So if we want to compute lambda g, then lambda g is just the sum, oh, well, sorry, it's just the product of the top chain classes on the summons. And if we take lambda g minus 1, we get something which is very similar. So one of the two factors decreases by one and the other one stays the same. And I'm putting the prime just to know on which component we are. It's not, it does not have a special meaning, but it's not a, they are not living on the same space and we should keep track of this. So if we work with the restriction of the product of lambda g, lambda g minus one, restricted to some state, then well, what we are taking is then the product of the two top chain classes, and then here we have the expression for the previous one. So let's see, in this first summon we have lambda g2 twice, so we have the second power of lambda 2g prime, and that is multiplied by, the, by, by lambda g1, lambda g1 minus 1. And then we get something similar because we get lambda g1 square, and then it's multiplied by lambda prime g2, lambda prime g2 minus 1. Now, if one looks at the way in which things are defined, one can prove that one, if one takes the top chain class of the Hodge bundle on MG and take its square, this always vanishes. So the point is this vanishes. I wanted to write it with color chalk. I might be able to do this. This is equal to zero. This is equal to zero. because on any mg prime bar, we have the square of the top lambda class is equal to zero. And so, in this way, we get the vanishing of the boundary. So this ensures that we know at which kind of intersection numbers we can look because we get some natural pairings. So I want to do to write all three cases at once. So I will put a star in the place of the decoration should be put. And then I say, well, I'm writing for that H, but the same pairing exists in, in Chow. The two discussions are completely parallel. Some things are easier to prove in cohomology, but So we can take any tautological class and then there is some kind of top degree in, so we take the complementary degree with respect to the top degree and then we can get a pairing with values in Q. So if we take a degree D class and the degree N minus D class, then what we can do is to take the integral over MG and bar. So if we are on MG and bar, we simply integrate the cup product of A and B, of alpha and beta. But then, of course, it would not be well defined if we want to work, for instance, on curves of compact type. So 
so in the case of compact type, we have to multiply further by lambda g. This is only for the case of compact type and rational tails. And if we want to also take rational tails, let me add a new color, we need to multiply by lambda g minus 1. And because of the fact, so here I'm using the same notation, but the idea is that we are lifting classes to, um, so we extend in an arbitrary way to n, g, n bar, but then the fact that the lift was arbitrary is uh, accounted for because we multiply by a class that anyway vanishes on the bound. And of course, this top degree, which we consider formally, is given by the dimension of the space minus the degree of these additional classes. We needed to have a well-defined pairing. So we have a top degree, which is what is called uh, to be, we always say it's the degree of the circle of the pairing, so the, the last non-trivial. So of course, if we are just taking stable curves, this is going to be the dimension of this of the moduli space. And then, as I said, if we take curves of compact type, then we can decrease by g because we are uh, cupping with lambda g. And for curves with rational tails, we dec <laughs> decrease further by g minus 1. And I'm interested in this only for g at least. Uh, I don't want to hear this uh, unless there is a, um, so if the genus is equal to one, then these two guys are equal. If the genus is equal to zero, everything, everything is smooth curves. Yeah. If you um, look at the pairing of the smooth curves. Yeah, yeah, yes. It's, uh, it's again the, the restriction. So it's actually the same kind of idea. One can realize it. I mean, yes, it, that discussion would give the pairing with lambda g, lambda g minus y. It's some kind of dual way to look at it. In the discussion yesterday, we ins instead of, uh, of uh, taking uh, the cup product with these two classes, we said, well, but we have a nice generator, the kappa class, and we use that to realize this isomorphism, but if we do the theory this way, we get something uh, equivalent. So for the previous discussion, you can already guess this, guess it. This is a good candidate to have a perfect pairing, but of course we know that already in the, in the most intuitive case, uh, the evidence seems to go in a different direction, so we don't expect that anymore. But anyway, there are also as I said, the kind of structure which was conjectured for, conjecture for mg by father, well, gives rise to, gave rise to uh, conjectures also in this case, and two of them are known to hold, so now they are properties and not conjectures. The first is the vanishing and soccer property. I'm actually, I would, pref I would prefer to state this in Chao because it's 
actually less uh, trivial in that case. So the idea is that we take the cohomology of the compactification of any of these partial compactifications in the top degree. This is indeed isomorphic to G, so in the, two ca in the three cases. So in cohomology, for the compactification, this would be trivial because it simply means that the, um, that the fundamental class of MGN bar has the expected dimension or something like this. And if we take a degree which is larger, then what we find vanishes. So this explains why it's enough to take values in Q here. Because indeed we are taking, as I said, we, we, can, uh, we can identify this pairing with taking with an appropriate identification of the generator in this, uh, in this isomorphism. And this has uh, several proofs. So the case of rational taste is what we, it's actually the same, uh, the proof is the same one as we discussed yesterday. Yes, thank you. And then if one takes it in chow and one takes a stable curves, this is actually the fact that uh, uh, the top tautological uh, um, group in chow is of dimension one is actually a non-trivial thing. It has been proved by Grabe and Wackel. Only slightly later than this. And then the case of curves of compact type has also been treated by Garvin and Vakil, but there is also some previous work of Faber and Panda Panda. And by now there are sort of unifying proofs of this kind of properties. And then also the intersection number conjecture generalizes. Yes, please. So you, yeah, I, I guess I don't no longer have this. What I wanted to say is that when we take curves with rational tiles, if we have if we have no mark points, there can't be the curves have to be irreducible because we, if we create a non-trivial rational tail, then we need three spatial points on it to stabilize. So one can be the singular point, but then uh, if we have no mark points, uh, we don't have anything. So if we look at curves with rational tails and we have at most one mark point, then we are simply looking at smooth curves. I, so, I simply don't understand that which part of the blackboard you are. No, I mean, um, if n is, no, I mean, if n is zero or one, the statement here is the one for rational tiles, and it should be compatible with what I discussed yesterday. Yes, there are conjectural or less conjectural generalizations of this kind of constructions to MGN without any decoration, so just smooth curves and a higher number n of mark points, and they are compatible with the one with rational tiles. But of course, if you don't, uh, if you don't stabilize uh, at least uh, not even partially, and you have several marked points, uh, the theory will, uh, will need, uh, I mean, it, uh, it's, uh, the complexity will increase much more in N than it does here. Here somehow it looks like all generators we are taking are the same and there is just one. Uh, so I guess that uh, there may be some social issues in, in that case. But I'm not discussing that kind of, uh, of, uh, of conjecture. So 
the only, the only structure we are discussing for smooth curves is up to one mark point, and in this case, we are thinking about relational taste as a special case of relational taste. What happens with smooth curves with more than two mark points is you not know, something I wish to discuss. The spirit is similar, but there are some uh, technical... Uh, um, there is some kind of technical evolution of the of the way to to state things, which is which makes them more complicated. It's a lesser symmetric theory. Are there any further questions? Yes. Ah, yeah. It's. Um, I don't know. I, it's something that comes from comes from the theory of graded rings. When you have a, when you have a pairing, the pairing has a soccer, which is the the the. Um, graded part in which you take the values. And morally, if you have a pay which is well behaved, that should be the last class which is non-trivial, and you want that it should be one dimensional. So if you are in this situation, you can you you so if you are taking a pairing of graded rings and it takes value in the top class which in the highest class which is non-trivial, you call that a soccer. So the soccer refers to this space. And the ring which has a perfect pairing in this sense is something which is called the Gorenstein ring. I guess this is coming from singularity theory as a concept. And then there is an intersection number conjecture, which is actually, well, I'm not going to write it, but it's actually even easier in these cases, because if we consider all possible values of g and n at once, then we can uh, use the natural maps to deduce intersection numbers to one case to the other. So somehow this allows one to restrict uh, to knowing all powers of the psi1 class or mg1 bar to know everything else. So anyway, this is also known, and this allows to compute all intersection numbers between tautological classes. that is it determines uniquely all intersection numbers. Between tautological classes. And this is now proved by work of many authors depending on the case. As I said yesterday, perhaps the case of rational taste was the hardest one. So there are by now several proofs, some coming from mathematical physics, other pretty geometric, and I would say the earliest one was 2000, around 2001. The most recent one I could talk was around 2011. And then, so this is what is known. So we are exactly in the same situation as we were before. And the, as I said, with intersection numbers, the fact that we are considering more spaces because we are allowed to have mark points is even making the formula looking more compact. But then, so this is what is known. And then there is the Gorenstein property, which uh, I'm calling a Gorenstein conjecture even though in this form it has never been conjectured by anybody, but it had been previously expected in the past. So don't go to any mathematician and say, you conjectured this and this is wrong, because actually nobody did. So the pairing we defined before is a perfect pairing. Morally, in all three cases, so you just give the most general false conjecture we can give.
And note that if this is true in the chowding, then it's automatically true in cohomology. So if one wants to construct a counterexample, it's enough to construct in cohomology. If one wants to prove the property, it would be nicer to prove it in chow, of course, since the thing would be stronger. So this is indeed the case if the genus we take is sufficiently small. For instance, in genus zero, well, everything is known. So for instance, in the case of, M of MGN bar, this goes back to the work of Kiel, who, who described the, the Chow uh, groups of M0 M and bar, but they are the same as the cohomology. So in this case, everything we discussed works without any trouble. And then for g equal to 1, and if we look at stable curves, well, if you remember in this case, I already stated that the tautological ring is the same thing as the even part of the cohomology. And this statement had long been claimed by Gessler with the only issue that he shared his uh, preprint only with his closest friends. So a proof was not generally available. And then came Peterson in 2014 who actually proved this. And if you look at this, and if you are interested in the fact whether the pairing is perfect or not, well, the pairing in this case uh, would coincide with Poincaré duality. So the statement that the pairing is perfect is equivalent to Poincaré duality for M1 and bar, and given that M1 and bar is uh, uh, smooth, or if you look at the quartz model space has only locally quotient singularities, well, this of course holds. the Gornstein property holds, and it's implied by Poincaré duality. So this gives a minimal indication for the genus at which the thing won't, uh, may fail. So, for M1n, curves of compact type are not the same as stable curves, but in this case, um, the Goldenstein property um, is known by work of Tavakol. And actually, if you go to up to genus 2, but you stick to rational type in a different paper, more recent, Tava could prove that the property, the Goldenstein property holds. So these are the good cases, the ones in low genus in which the property is known to hold. As we know, for rational tails and no mark points, there is a lot of evidence, and uh, yeah, certainly looking at genus 2 is not a and no mark points is not enough to get any kind of counterexample because indeed that was the first case in which the <laughs> intersection theory of um, G was studied. So these are the known cases, uh, the positive ones, so the, in which the, the Gornstein property holds. So up to here we have the, the Gornstein things. And then we start with the counter examples. So somehow the one which is uh, harder to break morally is the one that had been settled first. Because if you take if we take curves, uh, stable curves of genus 2 with 20 mark points, well, as long as we have no tautological classi uh, sorry, 
as long as all classes are tautological, we can sort of say, well, but more or less we are working with Poincaré duality, so we need to go in a range in which there are no, in which uh, there are non-trivial, non-tautological classes. And in this, this happens for the first time in NBAR 220, as was actually proved slightly later than our result, because the original result was uh, slightly weaker. So let me put just an N here, and it starts at 20. And uh, so this is not Gorenstein. This is something we proved together with Dan Peterson. And actually, the refinement that it's exactly 20 relies on uh, later work by, by Dan. So the idea is um, morally you expect you need the existence of non-tautological classes to disrupt this, the symmetry of the pairing which is coming from Poincaré duality. And then if you, are sufficient, if you can control sufficiently well how many new uh, non-tautological classes you, you get, you actually find that in the first case in which non-tautological classes exist, exist, this also disrupts the the, uh, the fact that the pairing was perfect when working uh, just on the whole uh, even cohomology. But as I said, if you work with curves with rational tails, I can explain to you later why. In genus 2, everything is still working perfectly. So you may wonder uh, whether Proving or disproving this Gorenstein property for curves of compact type is uh, easier or more difficult than uh, what, is, what it is for stable curves. Well, easier or difficult is just a property of the proof and not of the statement, so I, I can't uh, tell anything about this, but I can tell you about uh, how many points you need. So the idea is that if you take the topological ring of n to n compact type, this is not Gorenstein, so the pairing is not perfect. And you only need eight points to get this. So of the three cases I stated to you as a conjecture, only the one of rational tails is open, and there uh, you know that. Uh, so the only one conjecture which is open For the case of rational tests, as we discussed yesterday, g equal to 24, n equal to 0, but then there is evidence that one could also take g equal to 19 and n equal to 1. And it's perfectly plausible that we already know where to look for the counter example. So why, why does the Gorenstein property hold for curves of genus 2 with rational tails? Well, this is a general feature when studying cohomology. The reason why this is easier to study is that we construct the space of curves with rational tails in such a way in which it's fibered over mg. So in this case, over m2. By definition, if we forget all rational tails and all mark points, we get a vibration. So 
So somehow the, the basic idea is similar to the one we had here. In genus one for stable curves, uh, we said, well, actually, the cohomology, uh, the, the tautological ring is the same thing as, uh, well, the even part of the cohomology of a smooth variety, or a rational smooth variety. In this case, it was actually the same space. So if we have Poincare duality here, then we have the Gorenstein property here. And this vibration gives a similar identification for stable cohomology, but actually, uh, sorry, for for tautological cohomology, but actually in a different way. So the idea is this actually a projective vibration with smooth fibers. So if the point is non-singular, then we get the configuration space of n distinct points. Let me denote it by f and c, where c is a genus two curve. And this is just the nth power of C from which we remove all the diagonals, so all the n tuples in which we have uh, pi equal to pj with i different from j. And the fiber is some kind of compactification of this, which is actually known as the fulton macpherson compactification. And if we want, we can describe this as some kind of blow up uh, of C to the power n uh, by solving the fact that over the diagonals we have something different. So anyway, there is a morphism from here, a forgetful morphism from here to C to the power n. So what, uh, sorry, <laughs> I mean, I think I wrote the things correctly, but I simply I wrote them in, a, in an inverted order. So what I was saying is, this is a projective vibration, the, smooth, uh, the, the fibers are smooth, and are these configuration spaces, F, M, N, C, which are some kind of compactification of the space of configuration. So let me, if, can you read it here? So what I would say, this is the space of configurations, of n points, and this is uh, the compactification of it. And this is what is the fiber. So morally, we need to parameterize all cases, uh, all configurations of n points on a smooth genus 2 curve, and when uh, at least two points coincide, instead the same, they are the same, we build a tree of rational curves on which we can let them move. So every time we have a a map, and we want to compute the cohomology of the domain, well, if we have a morphism, we can look at the Lyrae spectral sequence, which associates to that. For vibrations, the form of the Lyrae spectral sequence is particularly easy, and for projective vibrations, we know that the Lyrae spectral sequence degenerates at E2. So this means that we this kind of vibration gives a decomposition of the cohomology of M to N R T in terms of uh, information that comes purely from M2. And if you want to know what this sentence means, what this means is that if we want to know the cohomology of H M to N rational case in a fixed degree K, then this will be the sum for P plus Q equal to K of the cohomology in degree P of M2 
The problem is uh, where do we take values here, because we, don't, we have to take values in a local system that's determined where the k cohomology of the fiber. So, the, so we need to take higher direct images of the local system on M2 and uh, rational ties. So what are, as I said, When we write this, well, if we take this over the curve, this is actually natural isomorphic to the cohomology in degree Q of the fiber, which is this fault of McPherson space. So, local systems on M2 vanish in degree zero unless uh, they have a non-trivial summon. And by this, uh, I'm stating this by saying, this means to me that if we take P equal to zero, we get a part of the cohomology of M2, which is easier to describe because the cohomology of M2 with constant coefficients concentrated in degree zero. So if we take P equal to zero here, this is actually isomorphic. to taking the cohomology in the Q of this thing, and take the part which is invariant under the action of the symplectic group. If you remember the cohomology, the only interesting part of the cohomology of the curve is just the H1, which is given, and on that the symplectic group acts by the standard representation. This induces an action, of course, also on the, on the powers of this, and, in the, in the, in the, and it also induces an action on the cohomology of this compactification. So we have an action of the cohomology uh, sorry, in action of the symplectic group, considered as a group scheme on the cohomology of the fiber. So somehow, in the special case in which we take p equal to zero here, we, are take, we have the same thing as the something which is natural isomorphic to the cohomology of a smooth variety. And then, we are taking the invariant part under the group action, and this is something which will respect Poincaré duality on the fiber. And if you remember, I mean, the space is just parameterizing configurations of n points, so it's something of dimension n. But n, small n, is also the top degree in the pairing in the specific case of genus 2, because if you remember, the top degree was always given by g minus 2 plus n for curves with rational types. So what I was saying is, in this special case, when we study the Gorenstein property, the degree, the fictive top degree we are taking is the same as the dimension of the fiber of this vibration. And as I said, well, there is a part 
of this direct sum, the one which we take p equal to zero, on which Poincaré duality holds naturally. Well, of course, there are some non-trivial identifications here if we really want to use the, 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 um, the ring structure, but we are just checking that uh, Betty numbers are symmetric, then this is enough to say, well, if we take the part of this direct sum that comes from p equal to zero, then it corresponds to some, some uh, kind of uh, vector subspace uh, of a family of vector subspaces on which the Betty number are symmetric. And then what one can prove is that this, the, the part of this direct sum that comes from p equal to zero is also isomorphic to the tautological part. Yes? Is it of Oh, yeah. Yes, that's what I wanted to state, yes. I don't like to write Q because I think that the correct thing is to think of SP as a group scheme so that you can adapt to the situation. But yes, that's a, and G was equal to two. So yeah, thank you. I had not realized that. And, and also, is any of this specific to DNS2? Like, why can't you do this? Is this not a vibration for higher genus? It's always a vibration for higher genus. But there are two things that uh, may be off. So the first thing is that uh, if the genus is higher than the then the degree of the pairing is not exactly equal to small n, so it will not be equal to the dimension of the fiber. This might be disturbing. And the other, the other issue, if we make a genus larger, is of course what I haven't written yet, but it is that if you take the part of this that comes from p equal to zero, then you get something which sits inside the homology, sorry, cohomology, and and, it's, uh, and we can identify it with tautological ring. So in this decomposition, the case p equal to zero gives the uh, tautological uh, uh, part of the cohomology. Perhaps I can even fit the statement here. So what we can do If we take k even, because if you remember, otherwise we'll have to descale anything, but, uh, everything, but then uh, if k is odd, uh, also this part uh, will give zero because, um, because of general facts about curves of genus 2. Sure. Yes. It's independent of C because if you take all uh, possible choices of C, they are, from a topological uh, point of view, they are all equivalent. Because, uh, and also if you consider the action of a symplectic group, it does not matter which curve you take. So it, the, the, the point is that this identification is up to homotopy, but everything here is homotopy uh, invariant. So that's the reason why it does not depend on C. As, as soon as you allow the curve to degenerate, you don't have this kind of nice description anymore, of course. So as I was saying, for k even, then we get, of course, a tautological part of the, the tautological thing inside cohomology. The point is that we can identify this with the case in which p is equal to zero. So if p is equal to 0, then q is equal to k. So what we get here Let me mark. So somehow one can realize this inclusion inside the information coming from the Larray spectral sequence, how canonical this is, is something, I mean, there are of course some technicalities which I'm not discussing, but the basic idea is exactly this. And once we have done this, we are exactly identifying tautological cohomology with something for which we know that Poincaré duality holds. So we are doing the same thing in a different way. I must say, Tava could prove it in the showering, and the proof there is more complicated than this.
So, what is the punchline of this? So, I was saying M, M2 and rational tense is the part that we can control. So, luckily for genus 2, there are not so many boundary devices which are, which are not on ratio of. Uh, which are in compact type but not a rational type. So it's just something about the case in which we have two components, both of genus one. So this allows one to do some kind of genus reduction. So the idea is that if we, if we know what happens with rational types, then we tend, try somehow to add the information about the boundary to it, and that's how, um, that's how um, Peterson found his counter example already for eight points. So somehow adding these uh, things, uh, coming from the case in which we have two components of genus one disrupts completely the symmetry of the pairing which we had here. Well, of course, also passing from compact type to, uh, from rational type to compact type is also moving the target because, of course, also the, the degree in which we are taking the pairing uh, uh, becomes different. Well, still, if n is sufficiently small, it's going to work. So it's not, a, we need some work to, to find out what is happening. So I don't know whether there are any questions about this, but I still have uh, at least 30 minutes left. Well, provided my, yeah, no. I, my watch is not particularly correct, but I, I do have almost 20 minutes left. So and I wanted to discuss briefly the whole theoretic, <laughs> the whole theoretic invariants. on cohomology, of course, of the modular space of curves, even if I'm not uh, writing explicitly. So the idea is that uh, if we look at uh, rational cohomology, of course, all cohomology group, uh, groups are Q-vector spaces, and this also holds for uh, the tautological groups. They are, of course, also Q-vector spaces. But there is not so much structure in there so it could be useful to add any more structure which is possible to get a, as complete as possible view on the properties. And if we work over C, the natural thing is to look at the Hodge theory, uh, so at the Hodge structures on the spaces. So if you remember every time, uh, we can recall that uh, cohomology groups of complex varieties, so let's say com quasi-projective complex varieties, always carry mixed Hodge structures. So. So in particular, if we are working with smooth uh, projective varieties, so smooth compact varieties, what we will have will be pure Hodge structures. So we fix. So if we take a cohomology group, it will be, uh, we we'll have an invariant called the weight, and it will start, uh, carry a structure which is given by some kind of decomposition. So we are just working on Q vector spaces, so we are working with rational Hodge structure. And as we saw yesterday in Inder's uh, talk, the idea is that we can complexify our vector space so that we have a complex conjugation there. And then what we want to have is a decomposition of VPQ, of V into VPQs, where the sum of P and Q is equal to the weight W we fixed at the beginning. 
and that is some kind of symmetry between them in the sense that if we invert the two indices, we have the complex conjugate of VQP is VPQ. Now, if you, if you don't like analysis in a particular way, but you prefer geometry, there is just one piece of information which is very valuable here and which has an important geometric meaning. That's the weight. Somehow the decomposition is a purely analytic tool. If we take a smooth projective variety, let's say, then this carries a whole structure of weight equal to the degree. So, for instance, Well, since we are taking uh, rational coefficients, it does not hurt whether instead of being smooth, it has a rational, uh, it has a local quotient singularities, so it could be something like the coarse moduli space of MGN bar. But in particular, this will also work with MGN bar itself. So this is a na nice case, but it's in a case which is one of the cases we are interested in. So if we are working on MGN, but this simply ensures that there are, there are some particular structure coming uh, from uh, Hodge theory that we can add to this. And equivalently, if we prefer to work with filtrations rather than with uh, decompositions, Well, we can instead take the Hodge filtration which is a decreasing, decreasing filtration associated to this, uh, to this decomposition. something decreasing, then we need to take uh, all cases in which the first index is at most oxygen. This is still called the index. And then because of this symmetry, the characterizing property is that uh, if we take Fp and F in the complementary degree uh, W minus P um, complex conjugate, then the direct sum should give the whole space because of the fact uh, that uh, we had this property and this decomposition. So this is all good, but as I said, if we are taking, so this works well if we are working with something compact and smooth, but in general the spaces we work with may not be any of, the, of, the, of those things. And in particular, if we are working with the modular space of curves and we are taking the open part of smooth curves, well, we will have something which is not compact. So does some kind of this structure, does some part of this structure survive? And the answer is yes. It's only that the choice of the weight is no longer unique for the degree in which you're taking cohomology. And this means that we need a second filtration to take, um, to keep track. It could be, I mean, it should be easy to, to check, I guess. So because I want to have a decreasing filtration. Did I put it wrong? I think you 
I mean, you are looking at the blackboard, so you are, your brain should work better than mine because you have some, you know, some kind of distance from the formula. So, never mind. So a mixed hot structure on a Q vector space. Is given by two filtrations. An increasing filtration, which is called the white filtration. starts at zero, but sometimes, sometimes they may be negatively graded. And then a decreasing Hodge filtration. such that if we take the graded pieces of the weight filtration, the Hodge filtration induces a pure Hodge structure on that. And so uh, somehow the, the geometric interesting information is coming from the weight filtration and somehow identifying the, the pure Hodge structure is more of an analytic property. So. How the strong invariant from the geometric point of view is now in this weight filtration well. So the idea is that if we take the filtration induced by F on the graded pieces of the weight filtration, so This infiltration we can portion by the previous one. Gives a pure Hodge structure. Of weight M on it. So the idea is that, well, let us assume that the W0 is the first uh, non-trivial thing, so that there's a filtration, that the wave filtration is non-negatively graded, as it would be for the cohomology of a smooth projective variety, because in general one could have uh, many possibilities. Then this means that uh, the first part, the first WM for which, uh, uh, which is non-trivial is given something intrinsic inside the cohomology, and the next one, uh, then classes of, uh, so class of weight one will be, so W1 will be an extension of W0 by classes uh, of Hodge weight one and so on. So somehow we start at the lowest weight and we add new classes uh, by taking some kind of extension. So if we, uh, there is a mixed Hodge structure, we have something which is an extension of Hodge structures and we put the, the, the Hodge weights in an increasing order.
So by the linear theories of mixed hot structures, if X is a quasi-projective variety, but we may generalize this to the case in which it is just some open subset of MG and bar, so for instance, in which um, X is MGN or its coarse modular space, since the cohomology is the same, then the cohomology with two coefficients carries a natural functorial mixed hot structures. And then in general, if X is smooth, then the weights can only lie between, uh, between the degree of the class and twice that. So if it is smooth but possibly not compact, Then the minimal weight, the, um, the one which is giving the intrinsic part, is equal to the degree in which we are working. But potentially we, get, uh, um, we can get uh, classes with weight up to 2k. So somehow this is giving, if, if x is smooth, the natural uh, part for the weight filtration is the one in which the weight is equal to the degree. If, and if x is also compact, this is everything we have. And the other one, hand, if x is compact, but possibly singular, then we have the decayed cohomology has weights between 0 and k. So if x is singular, somehow the natural invariants are looking at the classes of all weights 0. And if they are there, they have some kind of combinatorial interpretation in, te in terms of the, the singularization of the space. And the natural part, the one we expect to have, the one which has weight equal to the degree, is actually the top weight we can have. And because of the fact that these structures are functorial, if we consider these structures for the modular space of curves that has a natural action by the symmetric group, then of course they will, uh, they will respect, uh, the action of the symmetric group will respect the, the two filtrations. So it will uh, respect the, the mixed hot structures. I was hoping that uh, since there is not so much time left, uh, what was upcoming was uh, uh, which host theoretic invariants uh, are we truly going to wor uh, work with for MGN, but uh, instead what was coming in my notes was the example of PN. So the idea is that the only non-trivial cohomology of PN uh, is the one which we have in, all, in even degree between 0 and 2n. If you remember, this is one dimensional. And the notation for this pure Hodge structure, which will have weight 2k, is q bracket minus k. This is called, so we can use this actually as a definition of q minus k. And this is the whole structure of Tate. Of weight two k. So, what is the basic idea here? If the the easiest way to construct a Hodge structure in a one-dimensional rational vector space is to choose everything as trivial as possible, concentrated in H zero zero, and this would give a, a Q. Uh, here, for Pn, of course, we have non-trivial cohomology also in a degree which is larger than zero. 
and this produces some kind of a twist uh, of the structure uh, in which we are taking. And now all cohomology what can you think of it as an alternative definition is just all cohomology is concentrated in the central part of the decomposition. And then there is, of course, some additional uh, structure that is specifying how to embed uh, this uh, rational vector space into its compactification because there are also some final invariants there. So this is the characterization of this class Q minus K. It corresponds to the fact in which all cohomology is concentrated in this balanced part. So the other parts of the decomposition are, of course, trivial. So this is the nicest type of uh, Hodge structures. They are the ones we, we expect, which we find in all spaces that have a decomposition uh, into cells, which are isomorphic to Cn for some value. This is, of course, also true for Pn, because Pn is the union of uh, a point C, C2, and so on. And in general, the Tate Hodge structures are the kind of Hodge structures that we find on the algebraic part of cohomology. So if we take the fundamental class of a sub-variety, then it will also always have a Hodge structure of Tate. So we can think of this as the of something generated by the fundamental class of some p n minus k considered inside p n. And in general, fundamental classes, so algebraic classes in particular, in general, Of course, there is the Hodge conjecture that is morally asserting the converse to this. Somehow, that this is also a way in which you can recognize uh, uh, the, the fact that the algebraic classes exist. But we will not need this. And by the way, everything we saw, said before, but for this uh, uh, property that goes slightly twisted, not only hold for cohomology of um, varieties, but it also holds with cohomology, with complex support. If we want to pass to, from cohomology to cohomology with complex support, at least if x is smooth so that we can use Poincare duality, then we have to take try, so we have to take the real dimension of x. So we need to take a complementary degree so that we can use Poincare duality. We take the dual space, dualizing also the vibrations. And then we take the, we need to correct the weight by uh, twisting with a, with a certain whole structure of tight. So anyway, everything we did with cohomology also works with cohomology with complex support, only the, the bounce on the, the bounce on the weight will be different if x is smooth, because then it will be smaller. So, uh, 
The aim of this, of course, is to define to you which kind of Hodge theoretic invariants are useful when working with moderate spaces, of course, but uh, I gather this will happen tomorrow, and uh, so this was it for now. <laughs>